He's uh, made many presentations before, and he's a regular SIR member. So, Roger, take away. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. Uh, so, what's this all about? First off, Boston's University Club is not to be confused with Boston University. Okay, I want to make that clear from the start. What this deals with is basically the 1928 Olympics and the fact that the United States were not represented by any team. Now, in Canada's case, as you well know, uh, they were represented uh, by the Allen Cup winner in 1920 and 1924. And that would be the same in 1928 as well, with the University of Toronto grads, basically an alumni team from the iconic university in, in Toronto. They had won the Allen Cup uh, the prior March over the Fort William um, uh, Thundering Herd uh, in a four-game series out in Vancouver. And uh, they were regarded as virtually unbeatable. Uh, they had only lost one game along the way. And that one game was, was in the Allen Cup Finals. So uh, how did this happen to come about, the, the, the paper? I was asked by Tom Sersha, who was the director of the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame from 2000-2010, this question about why the United States didn't participate. And I'm going to address that later. Uh, but in uh, further researching it, I went back to a, a booklet that the late Don Clark had prepared about the United States participation in national and Olympic events. Now, by today's standards, this was uh, not um, in any great depth and it went from 1920 through, I believe, about 1986. But in 1928, it alluded to the fact that um, in early January, specifically January 6th and 7th of 1928, uh, the Grads, the Toronto Grads, Canada's team, came to Boston to play a two-game series against uh, the University Club. Now, that being made up of basically uh, Ivy League players. And it wound up being um, a, a total goal series, and it finished 2-2. But the U club team won the second game one to nothing, which proved to be the only victory that the Canadian team would experience uh, going all the way back to that, that game in the Allen Cup and all the way through uh, St. Moritz. So it caught my eye, and I said, gee, that, that ought to be an interesting topic to research and present. So that's what led uh, to today. Now, the uh, grads had uh, played exhibition games in December and early January in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, they would later play uh, in uh, the Maritimes. And the plan was then to depart for Europe from Halifax on January 22nd. Uh, but before that, there were these, these two games with, with the, uh, the U Club in Boston at Boston's Arena. So, who were the, the grads? The, the, the roster consisted of Stuffy Mueller and Joe Sullivan in goal, Frank Fisher, Rod Plaxton, Red Porter, and Ross Taylor on defense, Hugh Plaxton at center, Lou Hudson on right wing, and Dave Trottier on left wing. Other forwards were Charlie Delaley. Grant Gordon, Bert Plaxton, and Frank Sullivan. John Smythe was officially listed as coach, but a dispute over the selection of players kept him from going to St. Moritz. For the two games against Boston's University Club, Frank Fisher was uh, reported by the Boston Press as manager, which in those days, of course, really meant coach, though Joe Sullivan was reported as coach for the second game of the series. William Hewitt was listed as official manager and made the subsequent trip to Europe. Now that, of course, was Foster's father, better known as, as Bill Hewitt. Now as to the U Club, they were coached by Leon Tuck, who was Dartmouth's coach, and he had been on the United States Olympic team in 1920. And he had a, a, a roster of 19 that he could draw from, but those who uh, were going to play in the games lined up this way. Jack Fitzgerald and Ted Leonard were goalies, Sykes Hardy and Ed Maloney on defense, George Owen Jr. at center, 
Clark Hodder, and Doug Everett on the wings. The other spares were Sam Ferguson, William Berkeley, and Ken Marshall. The University Club had seen earlier action, defeating Yale 85, tying Harvard 4-4, and beating the undergraduate uh, Toronto Varsity Blues 2-1. While undefeated and coming off a recent victory, they fully understood the challenge. The quote I'm going to give you is from the Boston Evening Transcript. I will give you a number of quotes and cite the, uh, the newspaper so source. Bostonians are to have the privilege of witnessing a dress rehearsal of the Canadian Olympic team. This is a certain winner of the World Ice title, barring shipwreck or earthquake. <laughs> Properly keyed up, University Club can put up a great battle, but the grads have no such, no, have had no such, no, <clears throat> let me start again, but the grads have had so much more incentive than their Yankee rivals to get into the top form that they will be expected to hit the spy, high spots and keep clean the remarkable record of one defeat in 45 games. Now, the local uh, fans in Boston were familiar with players on the grass because the University of Toronto had been in there to play games against the Ivy League schools uh, when these guys were, were undergraduates. And so uh, the Boston Globe hockey writer John Hallahan observed at the time, Dave Trottier is a star wing, and with Hugh Blackson at center and Hudson on right wing, the grants have a formidable forward line. A sum of $5,000 is said to have been offered Blackston to turn professional. Red Porter is a flashy defenseman who is a real high-class carrier of the puck and with Ross Taylor as his sidekick should afford stubborn opposition for the attacking forces. In goal, Dr. Joe Sullivan, one of the very best ones guarding the nets in amateur or professional hockey, will hold forth. The spares, too, are capable of good work. Okay, so who did the university club have? Well, the two big guns were George Owen, Jr. George Owen, Jr. was born in Hamilton, Ontario, the son of a Canadian academic who moved the family to Newton, Massachusetts when uh, George Owen, his Jr., his son, was two years old. So he grew up in Newton and was an outstanding not only hockey player but also football and baseball. And he was known as Harvard George. Um, he uh, graduated in, in 1924. He was unable to play for the United States in 1924 because of business commitments. Uh, he then coached MIT for one year. And then when the U Club forms, he joins it in 1926 and 27, or the 26-27 season. The other uh, significant player was a, a guy named uh, uh, Doug. Everett from uh, also uh, in reference to the, the fact that uh, Tuck was uh, was coach was one of his players was Doug Everett who had come out of Hobie Baker's uh, alma mater which was the Concord uh, in Concord, New Hampshire, the St. Paul School. Then he went on to Colby Academy and then he had a great career playing for Tuck at Dartmouth. Now, both of these guys have also been, been captains of, of their, their teams. Um, so they, they were the, the, the top guys on the U Club's team. Uh, in, on the side of the SIR uh, <coughs> record of players, Patrick Huda, in writing about Doug Everett, said this, he had great stick handling ability, speed, shot and hockey smarts, a tireless player who could also play physically if needed. Con Smythe once said, let me tell you about Doug Everett. He is one of the greatest prospects I have ever seen and we would have liked to have had him on the Maple Leafs. He graduated from Dartmouth in 1926, uh, joined an insurance firm there in Concord and uh, at the same time joined the University Club. Okay, so on to the, on to the two games. Uh, Friday night, January 6th, Boston Arena. Uh, it sees 7,000, 3,500 come out. The, um, that that is, was a, a bit disappointing in, in the numbers because the, the series was hyped. Uh, but it was thought that the uh, 
ticket price having gone to 3.30 from the top price from the Boston Bruins, who of course played at this uh, place, from 2.50 to 3.30 might have uh, been a, an issue in keeping the attendance where it was, as well as, of course, uh, being on a Friday night, people uh, coming out of work, perhaps not being as uh, willing to go to see the game as they would the following night. So, as to the action then on, on the ice. The first period was in a moderate tempo, close checking. Uh, in the second period, the pace accelerated, and there were three goals in three minutes and 34 seconds. Bert Plaxton scored for the grads, Sykes Hardy for the U Club, and then Porter for, uh, for the grads, uh, putting them up two to one. Uh, third period, uh, the grads went into a defensive shell, the U Club dominated his play. Uh, uh, they scored, actually, but the goal was disallowed. And the same player, Ed Maloney, uh, also subsequently hit the pipe. But the grads came out of it with a two-to-one victory. And so they, uh, their reputation, uh, presumably, uh, still intact. But uh, they weren't uh, particularly happy with, uh, with their performance. And here's what uh, some of them said, all unattributed, all appearing in the Boston Evening Transcript. The worst game we've played in two years. We'll get six goals in the next game. <laughs> we've been taking things easy and aren't in the best of physical condition. I think the ice handicapped us a lot. <laughs> so obviously there's some, uh, some, some grief there. Uh, reinforcing uh, some of those comments, it was this from the Boston Globe. Uh, the ex-varsity players acted as if they could win any time they wanted. Rid Porter, manager Fisher, and Joe Sullivan giving rare exhibitions. Hudson showed himself to be the same temperamental player he was in his undergraduate days. While Hugh Plaxton and Dave Trottier at times developed flashes that indicated that they are real class hockey players. Once again, I'll remind you, these guys had been in Boston before as undergraduates. Uh, as far as the uh, university club, uh, and I detect certainly a, a, a discernible bias here, said the university club men looked good, played a remarkable game. George Owen was the same hard worker he always has been when opposed by stiff opposition. He labored hard, and Clark Hodder with Doug Everett were able to hold their own with the grads' forward line. On defense, Ed Maloney and Sykes Hardy were difficult men to break through. Jackie Fitzgerald made many remarkable saves. So the next night, it's uh, Saturday night in uh, Boston for game two. And um, that night, the backup goaltenders were used. Uh, Mueller going in for Sullivan for the grads and Lerner for Fitzgerald for the U Club. A scoreless first period, evenly played. Second period, uh, Clark Potter scored five minutes in uh, to make it one to nothing, and that was all she wrote. Uh, Lerner, the little goalie who was from MIT, closed the door, and uh, the U Club came out of it with a one to nothing victory, uh, much to be savored as you as you might have uh, imagined. So, what was the outcome of that. Well, the defeat was a bitter pill for the grass to swallow after their long string of victories that led to ultimate success in capturing the Allen Cup in 1927. An exhibition wins in mid to late December 1927 against the Windsor Intermediates, the Ottawa City League Combines and Pembroke. Okay, Boston Globe. The defeat of the grass by the University Club team was a shock to the Canadians. The stars from across the border came to Boston with the impression that they had only to go on the ice and walk through the Yankees, developed on this side of the line. Their cockiness resulted in their downfall, and the Toronto players left a bad impression. They were so upset that only Red Porter went to the university dressing room and congratulated George Owen and his mates. Entering the locker room after the game, Sullivan reportedly told the team, Well, you swellheads, see what happened to you? You let a lot of Yanks beat you. <laughs> Boston Globe. Now the matter of a lot of the Yanks plays into this because in Monday's Toronto Globe it was reported that uh, 
that the U Club was, was basically a Canadian team. Uh, not true. Outside of uh, George Owen, Canadian born, American developed. All the other players were developed in the United States and they were all New Englanders. And so that uh, argument was, was, was put to rest. So with that, how did the, how did the rest of the uh, season play out for, for both teams? Well, in the case of uh, the, uh, the grads, they played another six games and went 6-0, and oh, beating uh, the Nova Scotia All-Stars 14-1 on January 21st, 1928, get, get on, got on the ship, and then proceeded to uh, Cherbourg, and then there was an interlude in Antwerp, and then they went into St. Moritz for the, for the Olympics. Now, the European teams had held uh, three medal round uh, tournaments in which uh, uh, opponents were selected or, or played to select uh, to then face Canada. And Canada overwhelmed uh, the opposition. They defeated uh, Sweden 11 to nothing on, on February 16th. Uh, two days later, Great Britain went down 14 to nothing. And uh, on uh, February 19th, Switzerland 13 to zero. Total goals 38 Canada, opponents zero, gold medal Canada. Uh, overwhelming victory, uh, more overwhelming than in, in uh, uh, 20 and 24 when the United States was really the only realistic opponent that they had. Uh, uh, beat the US 2-0 in 1920 and then more decisively 6-1 in, um, in 1924. Okay, what about the, uh, the university club? Well, they continue to play, and, uh, and actually uh, uh, the following weekend they, they played Harvard and lost, and uh, the newspaper suggested that uh, uh, the, the uh, effort of uh, playing so well against uh, the grads had something to do with that. They then had a, lay a layover of about three weeks and then pl played the Canadian club of, uh, of Rhode Island and, and beat them, and then proceeded on the rest of the season against uh, college teams largely. But they ended up with uh, six games against uh, teams from the Maritimes. Uh, they played in Halifax uh, in uh, late February, and uh, two games there, and then four down in, in Boston uh, against some of the same teams. And they came out of that four and two, so certainly were, were competitive. And uh, although admittedly they were also bolstered by some additional players who had finished their college seasons and were now eligible to, to play. So winding up with a 10-5 with a, a and, and one record. So what started all this is uh, why, uh, why didn't this team represent the United States in, uh, in, the, in the tournament? Because we wound up, uh, quite frankly, sending no one. And so what was the, the, the gist of that? Well, the gist of it was that there were about, there were five schools that were quite willing to go. Uh, Augsburg College in Minneapolis, the University of Minnesota, the actually campus is a button, uh, Evelyn Junior College, Harvard, and uh, let's see, did I miss one there? Uh, don't think so. But for reasons of finances and academics, all of those bailed except for Augsburg. They were willing to go, okay? And they had a good team. So why didn't they go? On January 18th, the USOC Secretary Frederick Rubin announced in a telegram, Major General MacArthur, and we're talking about Douglas, the guy who would go on to have great fame in World War II, instructs me to inform you that the hockey team recommended is not regarded as a representative team and certification by the Olympic Committee is disapproved. New York Times, January 19th, 1928. Uh, the decision was received with great disappointment on the Minneapolis campus, and so one can only ponder what that was based on. I actually tried to find out why, uh, by going back to the minutes, but I, I was not able to determine this. I was dealing with somebody who had access to the USOC minutes. 
of that time frame, and there's nothing specific there. Uh, she kind of hedged your bets and put it this way. Well, basically, uh, that's what happened. Now, the comment, not representative, I personally think is legitimate. Oaksburg had five players from one family. Hansons. Not to be confused with <laughs> those other guys, okay? These were talented players. Uh, more talented, shall we say. Uh, Emery, uh, Emil, uh, Oscar, Julius, and uh, uh, Oliver, I believe, was the, was the other one. And the other three were, were uh, uh, Minnesotans. Now, these guys were the sons of devout Lutheran parents that had moved from Centerville, South Dakota, where some of them were born, to uh, Camrose, Alberta. And so, but essentially, they were Canadian developed players. I don't think we can dispute that. And the, the other three were not. So the question is, well, would one want the country represented by a team that was essentially developed elsewhere? Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, based on that, I, I, I wouldn't want the United States to be represented by such a team. Um, I know this from Bob Ritter, who uh, had the 52 and 56 United States Olympic teams that got silver, um, that uh, John Sigler uh, suggested for the first Canada Cup that the United States be represented by a team consisting of Canadian players that played for United States-based teams. Obviously, that didn't fly. Uh, we did not have a great team. But I don't think they really embarrassed themselves. And in fact, they played one hell of a game against Canada that some of you might remember. I certainly do. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so that's what happened. So no US representative uh, there. So how, does, how do uh, things uh, play out uh, as far as uh, significant players on these respective teams? Well, from the, uh, the, the grass standpoint, and who you'd be understandably more interested, the most notable player was a guy named Dave Trottier, who went on to an outstanding career with the Montreal Maroons. And uh, I hate to mention this to you Leaf fans, but in the first game of the Stanley Cup playoffs of 1935, <laughs> he gets the overtime goal against the, the, the Leafs, and of course the Maroons went on and, and won it. Uh, they swept them through three, uh, three zip. Uh, a very solid career. He winds up with Detroit uh, in his last year and then Pittsburgh in the AHL. He, he later went on to a business career and uh, uh, died at a relatively young age in, in his early 50s. So he's the most significant guy. The uh, uh, other grad player that I'll mention was Hugh uh, Paxton, who had a cup of coffee in the NHL with, with, the, with the Maroons, 15 games. Uh, how about the, the U Club? Well, without question, it's George Owen Jr., okay? Harvard George. He signs with the Bruins at the relatively late age of 28 and has a five-year career. He's frequently uh, teamed on defense with uh, Lionel Hitchman and somebody who we've mentioned here earlier today, uh, Eddie Shore, and uh, had uh, uh, particularly good playoff series against uh, the, the Canadians in the very early 30s. But most noteworthy from a standpoint of hockey in the United States is played by Americans. He is the first American captain of an NHL team. Now, people in Minnesota don't want to hear that because they always say John Mariucci is, but it's George Owen Jr., outstanding player. Uh, the other, uh, the other guy, Doug Everett, who I mentioned uh, before, uh, the, the Dartmouth guy, uh, despite the interest of pro teams, uh, Con Smythe and the Rangers and the Bruins, he does not play pro hockey. He plays for the U.S. Uh, in the 32 Lake Class Olympics, where they finished second to Canada. Um, the, there was a, a tie there, uh, but then the, the uh, game that did, uh, decided the, uh, the gold medal went to, went to Canada. But Everett played very well for the United States in that after which he, he retires. He continued to, to work for that uh, insurance firm in, uh, in Concord. Um, so that uh, was what happened to the, the, to the most significant players. Now if I could have been walking up, I just want to show you some visuals to show you some of the places and things I've been talking about. 
Uh, Boston are, uh, Arena now uh, called Matthews. It's uh, by, uh, controlled by North uh, Eastern University. Uh, and uh, it's an historic place. Uh, in 1922 and 23, the uh, uh, Fellows Cup playoffs in the United States Amateur Hockey Association are played there. And it doesn't go well for my team, St. Paul Athletic Club. Uh, but anyway, moving on then. Uh, okay, George Owen Jr., uh, Harvard George. By the way, he's inducted in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame in 1973. I was the first director. He did not come, okay? He did not come, and I think the best we got from him was a phone call that he wasn't coming. <laughs> I, am, I understand he was a very modest man, and that, that's all I can attribute to it. it. It just blows my mind that he wasn't there, and I never met him. Uh, this, this is a cartoon that talks about Owen, uh, talks about his, uh, his, his uh, significant play of the series. Mentions uh, Sykes Hardy's goal. Sykes Hardy, who has the U Club goal in the loss, uh, later goes on to be Harvard's coach in the 30s and early 40s. He may have been Cooney Wildman's predecessor. I'm not sure if there's anybody there before uh, uh, anybody in between. Doug Everett, uh, certainly a very good looking guy. We took him to U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame in 1974. When we took nine, we took 25 originally, then nine. I'm sure I met him. I can't say I have a conscious memory of a conversation with him, but uh, uh, I'm uh, certain that, that it, I did at least shake his hand. Okay, Bert Blackston, Red Porter, uh, most obviously notable players who I've alluded to uh, for, uh, for the grads. And then moving on to the man who broke the heart of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Paul, uh, Dave Trotty. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. And that's it. So that's the story of uh, the uh, U Club against the grads and why there was no U.S. representative in 1928. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. I was amazed at how I managed to leave people speechless. <laughs> Roger, did you try out for that team? <laughs> I didn't catch that. Did, did you try, try out, out for that team? Who played? No, I say, did you? Did I play for? Try it? out for that team. Uh, well, old, but not that old. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. question. The, the, the Boston Arena. This is the same arena, arena while the New England New England Warriors played in seventy-two, seventy-three. The WHA. Do you know if this is the same arena? Oh yeah. New England Warriors. Yeah, that's. You see the same? That's I. I, I yeah, did personally it. visited it. Probably some, maybe some of you have down there. Yeah, it's uh, Northeastern. That's their. That's their. What would the capacity? Seven thousand. Uh, which they almost they, the second game they got 6,500. The first game 3,500. The Bruins played there, right? Yes, they did. That's right. The, uh, uh, yeah, their ticket dimension was like 250, and they raised it to 330 for these two games. Yeah, shortly thereafter they went to the, uh, the Boston Garden, but I, I'm not quite sure if that's the next year or the year thereafter. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Did you uh, show that one of the two you you and these players? That's why. I just want you to point out the, the bottom of the uh, Porter's sweater. That's where the, the Maple Leafs colors came from, and the, the double stripe that, that Connie Smythe developed in the uh, for 1947. Bill, point of it. what's the uh, logo on the shirt? Well, it's, a, it's a team with the university crest. Well, that's the university crest at an angle? That's the university crest at an angle? Yes, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. It looks pretty neat. You didn't do much body checking, obviously. Mm -hmm. Roger, just one comment. Uh, you, you, you mentioned about uh, stopping uh, teams with Canadian players. Uh, what, in 36, Money of Earth did a very good job. Canadian players, you for Great Red War, yes, and won the Olympic Challenge. So, uh, and he, he wouldn't, uh, he, he would never renege on, on that, uh, that play. Yeah, I think there were only two uh, 
legitimate British players on that 36 team that is developed in Great Britain. Yeah, I think all the other, but they had English passports. Didn't Bunny and Harry claim that they were all Canadian players born of English parents? Yeah. Sometime in the last 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of them were born in England. Yeah.